let's at this point open up to some audience questions. Francis? Uh, so just on the nuclear issue, Mr. Barrett apparently, I forget the name, but uh, if the decision was made to go nuclear, uh, where do you envisage, let's say, the power stations being built in relation to the population centres, and let's say Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, and then uh, also in, in, in that context, we, we'd need to uh, d decide to have some uh, waste storage centre probably up in the centre of Australia. I'd envisage the power, the power stations to be on the coast within a couple of hundred of kilometres of the main load centres um, so that you could use seawater cooling. Um, that, that seems to me a very big factor for Australia. You wouldn't think of putting them inland because of the water situation. Um, and yeah, you, and you're looking at about a 10 year lead time, probably five years for the paperwork and the, and the talking and the, and the, and the um, approvals and uh, for certainly for the first ones, five years to build, typically four years to build once you get going. Um, as for wastes, uh, you could store it anywhere. Most, most high level wastes are stored at the reactor site for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, there's no need to move them. I mean, your typical 1,000 megawatt reactor uh, has a storage pool actually about the size of this room, pretty much the size of this room in terms of all three dimensions. Uh, and you can store about 40 years um, fuel, used fuel in, a, in, a, in, in that space. And then you can move it on, you can decide whether to directly dispose of it like the first diagram I showed, or you can decide whether to recycle it like the second diagram. Or recycle it properly, like with a fast reactor. Yep. <laughs> As I talked about in a minute earlier. If so. Okay, maybe someone up the top level here. Does the vision potentially uh, lead to Australia being an exporter of energy rather than an exporter of yellow cake? <laughs> um, well, it, it could be. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at there in relation to uranium. Yeah, or we it, have transmission lines through to Asia and we sell energy because um, well. um, if we have a a, a, um, a radioactive sorry a, a uranium future, you mean? Yeah, I'd give that to you. I don't think so. I, 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 you'd be, I mean, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam and Thailand are well advanced with plans for their own nuclear industry, so is Indonesia. So there'd be no, your, your transmission losses would be too great. Of course, we already export about 10% of Australia's electricity now as smelted aluminium. <laughs> That's <laughs> smelted aluminium is basically congealed electricity. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, maybe here. Thank you. Uh, comments on uh, public opinion. Of course, uh, we'd still be hanging people if you relied on public opinion. But my question is, how can we have a possibly have an open-minded debate on nuclear power in Australia? It was called for by Bob Carr many years ago when he's Premier of New South Wales. I thought, good luck. All we've had since is arguments and point scoring uh, on either side. Very intelligent arguments but how would any of the panel see an objective risk assessment, just like a, a criminal trial where both sides of the arguments are put objectively and open-minded people make the decision? Because I can't see politicians having the scientific knowledge or the open-mindedness to properly evaluate the pros and cons. Well, if I wanted to answer it slightly flippantly, I'd say name any issue where we actually do that these days in decision making, it's almost Real all. Trials. Yeah, but that, that um, is not a modern phenomenon. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd I, I just add that um, I, I did think that the Zero Carbon Australia plan was a useful um, contribution to generating a debate about the role of renewables and trying to roll it out in a short period of time. We just need more of that, um, and that's generated you know, by the Energy Research Centre. In, uh, in, at the University of Melbourne and, and our own you know, uh, colleagues here at the University of Adelaide are, are trying to generate debate as well. So we've got to build on that. Um, and so th I think you know, what's happened over the last 12 months is very encouraging, that, very encouraging in that respect. 
And we had the UMPA report on nuclear energy um, back in 2006, and that was you know, meant to be an objective look at it, but that was then trampled over by a, a federal election and sort of lost in dust. And um, that's, a, that's the way things seem to progress in Australia, that we seem to have these reports and then they get overridden by political concerns. So is that, I mean, that, that basically is the gist of uh, my push, and that is that uh, solar does not appear to have that encumbrance. Well, solar, solar has not had to encounter any resistance yet. This is the problem. I mean, if you look at wh what they're doing in the US right now, trying to build a large-scale solar plant in the western US, as soon as they've actually started to want to build a plant, people have been complaining about its effects on the local ecosystem, its impacts on the aquifer, um, the, the, the subsidy to the, to the um, electricity prices, it's always going to happen. I just think in Australia, it's a big unknown. We just don't know how the public is going to react to large-scale solar, especially um, depending on the way it's subsidised, for instance, and where it's put. So you could be right, um, and it could be that it become and it could be that it becomes economic, and Australia leads the way on solar. But I don't think it's a risk-free zone there. I think there are major hazards along the way that we just don't know about yet. Oh, sure. Yep. I'd, I'd agree that it's, it, that, it, that, um, that it's not a risk-free zone, and, and that goes for, for wind as well. Of course, we've seen you know, considerable uh, protests around that here in South Australia and elsewhere, but um, it doesn't have the historical baggage that I think nuclear has. I mean, you know, but it also doesn't have the historical experience that nuclear has either. Mm -hmm. I mean, nuclear's been the one technology that has seriously displaced fossil fuels in many places, um, and we haven't achieved it elsewhere. So. Nuclear has this baggage, but it also has this potential that's been realised that the others don't necessarily have yet. R remember, I think you've realised in this series, I'm not anti any particular technology. I do think nuclear will have a big role. Um, but I do think if we're serious about mitigating our carbon emissions and transitioning away from fossil fuels, we do have to look at history as a guide to what's been successful so far, and, mm. and uh, nuclear has. Could I just comment, you know, and the UK is very interesting because uh, in 2003 they had a big process and generated a white paper. And the white paper basically said forget about nuclear and we're all going to drive down this track of renewables, basically wind. Um, by 2005, 2006 that had completely changed. Now why had it changed in the UK, and I think your figures are somewhat out of date about UK public opinion by the way, um, on nuclear. Uh, why had it changed? The first thing is that the politicians suddenly realised that they'd been assuming that the public was fairly anti-nuclear, whereas the public wasn't particularly anti-nuclear in the UK. Secondly, they realised that um, they were on a hiding to nothing and they are going to really lose out if they simply threw money and threw money and threw money at renewables, basically wind we're talking about in the UK, uh, and that if they wanted to stay in power, this is the Labour government, uh, they'd better do something that actually worked. Uh, and thirdly, of course, uh, Britain has a long history of nuclear energy, so people are used to it. In London, about 40% of your electricity comes from nuclear power. The trains run on nuclear power uh, in the UK. So it was a relatively easy change for the Labor government to make, to say, well, look, uh, by 2006, nuclear is a no-brainer. We've got nowhere else to go. Uh, we've, got, we've got to do nuclear, and this is the way we're going to do it. And the way they're going to do it is to be very, very exhaustive about every aspect of nuclear pr approvals. It doesn't mean to say going back and debating safety and so forth any more than you do when you buy a car. You know, it's, it's there, the question's there vaguely, but it's not an upfront thing. But just all the approvals for the design of the reactors and for the siting of them. And there's a par t parallel process on both those issues, same as there is now in the US, and they're being very, very thorough and under the mantra of no subsidy for nuclear, making it absolutely clear that there'll be no public subsidy of any kind, although that language is softened in the sense that, you know, national energy policy means that we've got to be sensible, et cetera, et cetera. But basically no direct subsidy for nuclear, and there's no subsidy for nuclear, in fact, in any country of the world, anywhere at the moment. There is some offered in the US for 6,000 megawatts of uh, stepping up to generation three. But otherwise, no, there's only taxes. <laughs> but, uh, I'm just going to say, but don't we have to face the reality in the Australian context that you know, the Australian Labor government hang, hangs on the thread, and that thread is its coalition with 
the Greens. Uh, so for the next three years, it really is just impossible to see how a debate around nuclear could actually uh, be, be generated at the national level of Australia uh, uh, within the Australian government. It just doesn't seem to me conceivable. So we are losing enormous time, I think, um, yep. in, I in addressing the problem. When you, when you talked about the regulatory uh, process, I would, I'd be interested to know what, what, how long do you think it would take for us to, to set up a regulatory structure to approve, to, to examine approve and, uh, of the design and building of power stations? I, I think probably five years. I mean, the, a lot of countries are setting up this, this kind of structure at the moment with the International Atomic Energy Agency holding their hand. Right. A lot of countries, about 20 or 30 countries that are wanting to get into nuclear power at the moment. Uh, and there's about 10 of these that are very well advanced in it and we could quickly get into that cohort of 10, I imagine. Uh, we've already got an our panzer and so it would be just a matter of expanding that. You probably would not get into a process of Australia certifying designs any more than we do with aeroplanes. We don't, do, we, do, we don't certify the designs of Boeing 737s or Airbuses. We let somebody else do that. Right. And that would be the case with reactors. So the focus then would be on the actual siting. I know we're running out of time. Um, maybe we'll have two more questions, one from below and one from above. So maybe starting above. Hi. Um, now, I know that uh, everyone's probably attended the the uh, lecture focused on nuclear power, but uh, for an audience that seems reasonably pro-nuclear energy, I just thought I'd ask, um, for the sake of those who weren't, um, what is the current standing um, of nuclear reactors with regard to the waste? Um, is it, well, it's clearly not at all like it was in, in the past. Um, are we looking at a simple matter of, of storing or recycling and then having nothing left with absolutely no consequences, or are these uh, so-called ideological um, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. certain I'd ideological um, counter-arguments? Don't, I don't think there's an ideological issue re regarding waste as such. There's a bit of a spooky issue but, but that, that's generated here and there. But basically, you can do, firstly, low-level waste is, is straightforward. We've got heaps of that in Australia at the moment. It needs to be disposed of properly, but you can keep it under your bed without any harm. Intermediate-level waste does need to be shielded, and there's a bit of that not terribly hard to deal with. High-level waste is what we mainly focus on, so let's just focus on that now. High-level waste is very dangerous stuff. It does need to be shielded, and it does need to be cooled. And a 1,000 megawatt reactor produces about 27 tonnes of used fuel each year, which is either treated as high-level waste, as in the <coughs> USA, or it is recycled, as in Europe. Now, if you treat it as high-level waste, you let it cool for about 30, 40, 50 years, by which stage the radioactivity and heat generation is down to about 0.1% of what it was when you switched off the reactor to take the fuel out. It becomes more benign with time, but the curve's flattening out at that point. It's still dangerous after 50 years. You don't handle it in the way you saw that photo with, with the new fresh fuel on it. Um, if you recycle it, uh, you get a lot more energy out of the uranium, and that makes sense. That's why Europe, Japan, Russia, many countries have recycling as a base, China as a policy. Uh, what you're left with then is about 3% of that 27 tonnes, which is high-level waste and unequivocally waste. Uh, you can then vitrify that, put it into borosilicate glass, which increases its volume about fivefold, um, and you're then looking at a whole lot of canisters of highly radioactive glass. And, and the, 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 again, the idea is the intention has never been to do anything much with that inside 50 years, because the radioactivity level has decreased by then. The consensus worldwide for that kind of waste is that it be put in deep geological disposal, 500 metres down. Can't come to any harm to the biosphere or anybody. Increasingly, there is a move to actually separate that waste into the long-lived stuff, which is not terribly radioactive in, in the sense that you can keep a bit of it in your pocket. Um, but uh, and the shorter-lived stuff, which is intensely radioactive, that's mainly fission products. 
and then the fission products get dealt with and after about 100, 200 years, they're fairly innocuous. But the long-lived stuff goes on and on and on and on. But the long-lived stuff you can burn and this is part of the, part of the rationale for fast breeder reactors or fast neutron reactors, being more generic, is to burn these long-lived wastes. Transuranics or actinides are the two terms used of them. And uh, that seems to be the way everybody is pointed in the world today, although there's not much action in that direction yet. But the basic thing, basic question I'd leave you with, with regard to high-level nuclear waste is, we're, we're 55 years into the nuclear industry. Where have these wastes ever been a problem? Where have they ever been a hazard? They're very easy to deal with. Technologically, there is no problem at all. Politically, big problem. Politically, there is a big problem in every country about the disposal of these wastes. OK, last question <laughs> down the front here. Just to talk about relative risk. Um, Chernobyl killed about 56 people. Uh, motor vehicle accidents kill about a million people a year and injure about 50 million. Those figures were so staggering. I'm just wondering if our panel can confirm or deny them. Well, the UN report on Chernobyl issues the figure of 56. Um, I can't improve on that. The, the other figures you see about Chernobyl, as Bob and I'm sure you're aware of, is that there is a hypothesis out there called the linear no threshold hypothesis, which says that every bit of radiation is dangerous and that um, because radiation was spread around much of Western Europe by the Chernobyl accident, that at some point um, X number of hypothetical humans will die of that radiation at some point in the next 80 years. Um, the reality is that we haven't been able to measure any increase in the cancer risk amongst that general population yet. And so you can invent a figure anywhere from zero through to a million, uh, through to a million people who will eventually die or have their life foreshortened by X number of seconds as a result of, of that accident. The point is what we can measure in terms of risk was 56 people were killed as a result of the accident and then probably um, on the basis of the evidence, epidemiological evidence we've collected to date, a few hundred more people will have died of cancer as a result of it. But the broader point is, and this is why I never really talk about Chernobyl as being um, anything more than an anomaly. It was a, a, a reactor built for breeding plutonium for a weapons program without a containment dome. It had the positive void coefficient. It was a sort of reactor that was never built in the West for many safety reasons, and as Ian said, um, it, it was a reactor that was out of its time already in the mid-1980s. And if we're going to look at seriously at the risks of nuclear energy today, then we look at what sort of reactors are operating today and being built today and assess the risks on that basis. And that's the only sensible way to do it. Look, I would like to go on for, for many more questions um, to come, but we have to draw it to a close. Everyone uh, needs to get back home. But I really do thank you for your enthusiastic support for this six-part series and um, the, the vodcasts are available on the web. Uh, next year we hope in fact to do a, a road show and take a few of the key highlights of it around to other places in Australia um, to keep people continuing thinking critically about sustainable energy because it's, a, it's an issue that's not going to go away, it's going to continue to, to rise indeed in prominence in public dialogue over the next few decades, um, probably most significantly within the next five years as we really decide what we do about replacing our coal-fired power stations, how we deal with the impending uh, shortages of, of oil worldwide, um, how we continue to develop a prosperous, <coughs> low-carbon society um, whilst at the same time doing it economically and doing it in a way that fits socially and politically and sustainably in the long term. So keep on thinking critically about sustainable energy and uh, I look forward to engaging all of you in these sort of discussions in the coming years as we continue to look at new advancements in these fields and assess how the reality actually unfolds across the world. Thank you very much.